This is CBC Vancouver News. It is uh, certainly not a budget that I am happy to deliver. Double-digit increase. The city of Surrey is proposing a big jump to property taxes and is blaming that city's policing situation for it. In general, it just makes me sad because a lot of people rely on these. And Dozens of bike tires slashed as tensions between cyclists and motorists in East Vancouver grow. We're just raising a lot of funds to help kids uh, with just being geeky. For the first time since the pandemic, beings from different universes were able to come together, this time for a good cause. Good evening, I'm Susanna De Silva. The city of Surrey has released its draft five-year budget, and it could mean a painful tax bill for residents. Surrey is proposing a one-time property tax increase of 16.5% for this year, with the mayor blaming the previous council's decision to swap police forces. Yasmin Renea has more. Nine and a half percent of the proposed tax increase is to cover the costs associated with the police transition. The city says maintaining the RCMP will cost about $235 million less over the next five years than the Surrey Police Force, but that there remains a shortfall of about $116 million created by the transition process. Surrey's mayor accuses the previous administration of wasting money on an experiment to change policing, and her council is having to play catch up on core city services. We have to make sure that in Surrey uh, we are rectifying the past, that we are um, rectifying what was a misguided police transition and that our finances are going to be taken care of properly moving forward. The budget says the average single-family house can expect to pay $219 more in property taxes next year. It is a budget that only considers the option of maintaining the RCMP, though the city is still waiting for an approval from the province. Last month, the BC government said it needed more information before deciding which force would police Surrey. Residents are slamming the move, saying life is already unaffordable. It's already so hard for young people to plan to buy a home, so this implement is going to make it much harder for young people. Like at this time, the most important thing which uh, the government and the city has to address is the uh, blowing rate of the properties. Locke was asked why this information was released on a Saturday of a long weekend, and she said with a council meeting to discuss this increase coming up on March 6, she wanted the public to hear about it as soon as possible. Yasmin Raneya, CBC News, Vancouver. Search and rescue volunteers in BC's Caribou are mourning the loss of one of their volunteers tonight, killed in an avalanche they responded to. Tani Bird Anderson died in BC's backcountry a week ago. The recent Simon Fraser University graduate was an experienced and trained backcountry user. She was skiing with a friend who was also killed. We just would really like to say that our member who we lost was a very kind, loving and bright soul with a huge love for the outdoors. He was going to be deeply missed by friends, family and the entire community. It's part of the reason why we're urging so deeply for people to not take the risk because even people who are highly trained, it's still there. So far, there have been five fatal slides on BC mountains. Nine people have been killed, including the slide that killed Anderson on Potato Peak. Her colleagues and other experts are warning the conditions are extremely dangerous and the risks aren't obvious, even for experienced backcountry users. The mayor of a small BC community is raising the alarm after one of his friends died waiting for an ambulance. The CUSP mayor, Tom Zelesnik, says after waiting more than 45 minutes, the man's family decided to try to get him to hospital themselves. So they made the uh, choice to, they had to, uh, with another friend, put them in a van, and as they're going down to the hospital, which was about five minutes away, uh, he had a massive heart attack, and when they... So there was one friend that knew CPR, and he's trying to do uh, CPR in a van, which is very difficult. 
But upon arrival at the hospital, the man in his 60s was pronounced dead. The only available ambulance that day was two hours away. BC Emergency Health Services says there was no service in the cusp that day after someone called in sick. The mayor says the community successfully lobbied in the fall for 24-7 ambulance service, but they haven't reached that mark yet. He says challenges recruiting are a problem in his and many small communities. More than two dozen bike tires have been slashed at a bike sharing station in East Vancouver. As Yasmin Narea reports, it appears tensions between motorists and cyclists are ramping up. About 30 bike tires have been slashed here at the 20th and Commercial Station. Bike sharing service Moby says the vandalism happened over several days. The damaged bikes have been removed for repairs. In general, it just makes me sad because a lot of people rely on these and like if we want more people biking and building you know, healthy habits, uh, it'd be good to have like a consistent station here. East Vancouver resident Julian Mintasti has documented recent tensions between cyclists and motorists. On Wednesday, he saw this letter from a neighbour pleading for the tire slashings to stop. The next day, it was covered by another note with profanities, saying us motorists want our parking spots back. So if I see anything else, I'll... I'll take a picture of it, but I honestly hope that that person stops because, uh, you know, it's pretty bad that it's becoming inconvenient to people in the neighborhood. The city of Vancouver says the Moby station on 20th and Commercial takes up the space of two regular parking spots and one motorcycle spot, while 94% of the street is dedicated to vehicle parking. If you don't have Moby bikes, some of those people might be forced to use a private car and store it on the street, which makes it more difficult for motorists. So I think people who are disgruntled about Moby bike spaces taking up um, private car parking spaces spots really need to look at the bigger picture. The Vancouver Police Department is investigating the slashing incidents, while Moby is asking anyone who witnesses more bike vandalism to contact Moby or the VPD. Yasmin Ghaneya, CBC News, Vancouver. The BC Salmon Farmers Association says a decision by the federal fisheries minister to not renew licenses for 15 open net Atlantic salmon farms in the Discovery Islands is short sighted. We're very angry about the decision. The minister ignored her own scientists. She uh, ignored the presentations that have been put forward by the industry. The association says the permanent removal of these farms will have devastating effects on rural coastal communities that rely on the industry. It says at a time when grocery prices are high and the country is heading for a recession, further loss of jobs will have far-reaching negative implications. An organization representing First Nations in favor of open pen salmon farms is also at a loss. Minister from DFO has not listened to Indigenous communities and where the impacts are going to happen from decisions that they make. And the communities that I work with have found an opportunity going forward around self-determination, around partnerships in this industry. But the chair of the First Nation Wildlife Alliance says most BC First Nations are opposed to the farms. The vast majority of First Nations in British Columbia do not support open net cage fish farms. When you consider Discovery Islands, there are seven First Nations that have identified that as their traditional territories. Four of them remain opposed to open net cage fish farms. Minister Joyce Murray says wild salmon are in serious long-term decline and the government is making protection of the species a priority. This Family Day weekend, a Vancouver organization is doing what they can to help out families in need. With inflation affecting everything from rent to groceries, Family Services of Greater Vancouver held a pop-up to offer free resources to parents. Yasmin Gandam reports. For Pranthnia Moore, a parent in New West, it has been a struggle to put food on the table in order to feed her family. Every time I go onto the aisle, I see that even the prices of bread, milk, like the eggs has gone up. So I think um, that is what is affecting. And even the candy. <laughs> <laughs> She's a new immigrant from India and says that makes it even harder. So for a recent immigrant, um, more sober, it is Ma, affecting uh, bad um, I don't need it. Yeah, we have to make decisions I don't need it. Um, as to <laughs> what is the necessity Thank and you. what is like the want. She joins other parents turning to family services for help with inflation impacting daily life. 
our intent really is to let people know that there is help available because oftentimes when inflation is high like this and people are struggling they think you know this is hopeless there's 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 no resources um, and our message is yes there are and and we're here to help all of our services are free Family Services of Greater Vancouver offers workshops and support for families to get by. They offer programs throughout the Lower Mainland, including counselling, financial empowerment and community kitchens. The organization says it's seen an increase in families calling for help. Over the past year, they've tripled the number of workshops, serving over 2,500 families. I think all of us are feeling it is inflation and higher interest rates are really impacting uh, families as they struggle to do things such as pay rent, uh, put food on the table, and uh, meet day-to-day -day expenses. Their goal is to help anyone, no matter what their family may look like and what their needs may be. Um, I think it's important for me as a parent, for my child, to see that families are all different and uh, that as a community we can come together and support one another. Yasmin Gandam, CBC News, New Westminster. Collectors, artists and gamers are gathering at the Vancouver Convention Centre to attend BC's biggest fandom event. It's Fan Expo's first year back without pandemic restrictions and that means plenty of costumes. Ali Patarge tells us about a group of Star Wars cosplayers using the Force for good. Uh, you come in here. Okay. Yeah, sir. Turn around. <laughs> I'm Major Poppins. I'm practically Imperial in every way. It takes a committed cosplayer to stay in character. Sorry about that. Your rebel height. But these Imperial officers and stormtroopers are not attending Vancouver Fan Expo in service of the Empire. They're here to be a force for good through cosplay. We're spelling it with C-A-U-S-C, -S -E, like as in, uh, this is a cause to us. We're just raising a lot of funds to help kids uh, with just being geeky and all that sort of stuff. Williams is part of the Vancouver chapter of the 501st Legion of Outer Rim Garrison, a cosplay group who gathers donations for children's charities. They are, as he says, bad guys doing good. He's suiting up to be blasted by Nerf guns all day, and the more shots he takes, the more money can be given to variety kids. It's easier when you have a bucket on. I think like Oscar Wilde used to say, it's uh, give a man a mask and he'll tell you the truth. And so I, I start to feel myself when I'm in this thing. So what is a Star Trek fan doing in Star Wars territory? But well, Fan Expo is where all fandoms converge and are more than welcome to take a shot at the Galactic Empire. But I have to say, we shot first. <laughs> Fandom rivalries are put aside in the Vancouver Convention Center, all for the love of not just cosplay. Attendees are playing games, buying collectibles, and meeting fan favorite personalities. Sean Astin! Last Fan Expo, it felt still like different because of COVID. Everyone was scary, but this is the first time it feels like back to normal. We tend to be something else for a little bit, you know? We get to be ourselves every day, but it's not every day you get to be a Ghostbuster. And through the 501st Legion's fundraising, Williams hopes cosplay can bring people to the light side. We don't do it to relive our childhood, we do it so kids can live theirs. There's a lot of fun dressing up as, a, as an action figure, but when you get to bring smiles to faces as well as just bring a lot of money and awareness to a variety of charities, it gives us purpose and meaning. Fan Expo is where attendees can create connection through a shared love of all things nerdy to the delight of certain beloved characters. So how are you finding Fan Expo so far? <laughs> Ali Patarga, CBC News, Vancouver. Fighting for safer sports, officials meet to figure out how to protect the country's young athletes from abuse.
The war in Ukraine was the prime focus on the second day of the Munich Security Conference in Germany. It has now been almost a year since Russia invaded, and a number of leaders attending the conference are promising more help and urging other nations to follow suit. The CBC's Lorenda Redekop has more. Ukrainian soldiers are trying to hold off a Russian push in Bakhmut. The city in the country's east is seen as the front line for fighting. Ukraine is pleading for more military equipment. This command officer saying, tanks, artillery, we are waiting in order to counterattack. It's as many Western leaders meet in Germany at a security conference. Notably not here, any Russian officials who weren't invited. Today, the U.S. vice president made this formal accusation against Russia. There is no doubt these are crimes against humanity. U.K. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak urged other countries to send more armored vehicles and weapons. Now is the time to double down on the support that we provide Ukraine. We're at a pivotal moment in this conflict where if we provide Ukraine with the extra means that they need, then they can turn the tide and liberate their country. Canada's foreign minister is also at the conference. Earlier this week, she visited Ukraine, where she pledged more Canadian support, including for women and children affected by war. And Ukraine's children are the focus of a new report by a U.S.-based non-governmental organization, issuing what it called a gigantic Amber Alert. It collaborated with the U.S. State Department and says researchers confirmed at least 6,000 Ukrainian children have attended re-education camps in Russia in the past year, some just babies. A curriculum of Russian patriotic education. They're not allowed to speak uh, Ukrainian. But in the case of two camps, one in Chechnya and the other in Crimea, boys from ages of 14 to 17 are getting firearms training. One more tragic revelation almost a year into this brutal war. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. And today's discussions followed last night's claim from the U.S. that Russia's so-called Wagner Group has suffered 30,000 casualties in Ukraine. White House officials say it's happened in fighting with Ukrainian forces in the east. The CBC's Sarah Larniuk has that story. What we know is that increasingly the more information we get about that eastern battle is that it is a, uh, a battle of attrition with Russian soldiers just continuously pelting Ukrainian forces on that eastern front. Uh, Ukrainian figures have indicated all month that this is, in fact, the bloodiest part of the war for Russian forces. Uh, Ukrainian data indicates that as many as a thousand soldiers have died in a single day uh, in that area. Um, and so we've been getting that picture. However, those those figures from the Ukrainian military are often unverifiable. And so this new information from the White House really does just cement how bloody the battle in the East has become uh, with 30,000 uh, injured or killed and 9,000 of them killed, half of them since December and most of them on that Eastern Front near Bakhmut. It is, of course, a largely symbolic victory that the Kremlin is looking for on that Eastern Front near Bakhmut. Uh, and we know that Ukrainian forces are also suffering uh, high casualties. However, they're not estimated to be anywhere near the, the size of Russian losses. That was the CBC's Sarah Larniuk. The number of dead from the earthquake in Turkey and Syria has now passed 46,000. <laughs> Miraculously, some people are still being rescued, but many are still missing. Authorities now have not said how many, and in Turkey alone, about 350,000 apartments were destroyed. Among survivors, officials say infections are increasing, but don't yet pose a serious threat. Aid organizations say with so much infrastructure and ruins, assistance will be needed for months. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter has decided to receive home hospice care. A statement from his foundation says he wants to spend his remaining time with his family rather than continue medical intervention. Carter was president from 1977 to 1981. He's now 98 years old, and he suffered from several health issues. The most serious was melanoma that spread to both his brain and his liver. 
Canada's sport minister wrapped up meetings this afternoon with her provincial and territorial counterparts at the Canada Games in Charlottetown. The meeting comes against the backdrop of what Pascal saint says is a crisis in Canadian safe sport. Jamie Strachan has the story. It seems barely a week goes by without another story of a Canadian athlete speaking up about abuse or a coach being charged. Canada's Sport Minister Pascal St. Ange says she is doing all she can to protect athletes under federal jurisdiction. Last year, Ottawa committed $16 million to create and operate the Office of the Sport Integrity Commissioner, or OSIC, an independent office to investigate athlete complaints. It serves about 4,000 federally funded elite athletes. St. Ange has been pushing the provinces to either join OSIC or create their own complaint mechanism with the goal of having something accessible to all athletes, from potential Olympians down to the local level. There was no agreement uh, during the meetings today, but there was a commitment by each province to have something in place by the end of 2023. Neil Lumsden is Ontario's Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, this is not a, for us or anybody else, a rush to get it done. It's a rush to get it done right. And for us, we have different obstacles and barriers from province to province to territory. So uh, we are taking some best practices, having great conversations. That's one of the things that came out of the last two days is how do we move ahead in an effective, efficient way to make sure we help solve the problem and not just be there to say we've got something and it hasn't got teeth to it. An ongoing CBC News and Sports investigation has highlighted the need to protect young athletes. It's revealed that most abuse in Canada is happening at the local level, where hundreds of thousands of Canadian children participate. Since 1998, close to 300 coaches have been convicted of a sexual offence against a minor under their care. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Here is a live shot of a dry but chilly BC place. I will have a quick look at your forecast and sports coming up right after the break.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On March 8th, celebrate International Women's Day with Gloria Makarenko at the West Coast Leaf's Equality Breakfast. Get your tickets at westcoastleaf.org. And dance away the winter blues with Corleone at Pop Capella 3 on March 3rd and 4th. Backed by a band of Vancouver's best, the Corleone Ensemble will take on your favourite hits. Tickets at corleone.org. And the Canucks were looking to end a three-game losing skid tonight against the Flyers. There's a little wrist shot, get it through, and there's Beauvillier. And things got off to a good start. Anthony Beauvillier started the scoring at the five-minute mark, then off to the second, and it was Beauvillier again off a of Pedersen shot, putting the Canucks up 3-1. to one. And then in the third, it was Elias Pedersen again. He ices it with two empty net goals for a five-point night. Vancouver takes it 6-2. to two. And before we go, let's take a quick look at your weather. It is five degrees outside right now, but the forecast is showing things will turn. You'll see six degrees right now at the Vancouver International Airport, five degrees in Pitt Meadows, five degrees in Hope, and five degrees in Abbotsford. A little chillier in West Vancouver, but that forecast is showing things cooling off towards the end of the week, even a chance of snow by the end of the week for Metro Vancouver. So enjoy it right now before that comes in. And that is your late news for this Saturday night. We want to thank you very much for watching and of course for news at any hour you can always go to our website that's cbc.ca slash bc. Have yourselves a great night and a good rest of your weekend.